Hello, and welcome to the Womb Centered Healing Podcast. I'm Sama Morningstar, and I'm thrilled to have Erica Amazing here <laughs> with me today. Thank you for joining me, Erica. Erica is, um, has just recently released her book. It's called The Weirding Way, and there's a, there's a tagline as well. Perhaps, Erica, you can tell us the whole title as I'm not remembering the exact wording right now. Well, thank you for inviting me, dear Sama. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> for another call. We had different calls together in the past, but now it's about the birthing of my book, which just happened last Saturday. Yes. It was my birthday on the oh, magic yes. day That's of right. the fourth of the fourth of the fourth. All right. <laughs> At 4.44. Yes. <laughs> so this is so much about the magic of numbers, uh, which I love a lot. And I write about this as well uh, in my book. It's called The Weirding Way. And the subtitle is The Mysterious Art of Weaving Your Own Destiny. Yes. So the magic of numbers also plays a part of it. <clears throat> yes. And, and we were just talking before getting on the, the call here, or before starting the recording, about how the, the main translation of the weirding way or weird is the womb of creation. Can you talk about that a little bit? Because this will help uh, folks listening to feel the interconnectedness, the interwovenness of the womb-centered healing work that I'm always talking about and the weirding way work that you're always talking about and how close our our paths are and intertwined and have been for years. So please share about the weirding way and the womb. Yes, of course. It's one of my favorite things I like to share um, because I'm also part of your apprenticeship. The 13 uh, Moon Biomystical Apprenticeship has been also very paramount on the path of writing my book. And the weird in the Norse language is like the rune, weird is nothingness. And as we all are born from nothingness, which is like the womb of all existence, uh, the weird means getting to this point of nothingness, where everything at the same time originates from. Like for example, there's the web of weird, which encompasses all lines of all runes, which can also be translated to all timelines within the whole physical universe, but which also get, spring forth from nothingness. Like the rune of weird is nothingness, and at the same time it forms the web of weird of all different lines which are there in the physical realm. And I think that is like the most magical process which you can uh, translate in all, in, in every domain in life. You know, I, I think it might help too, because when you say nothingness, there's two directions of energy flow that, that are possible when we contemplate nothingness. Um, and one is sort of uh, moving away from everything to try to get back to that nothingness, uh, which is often the direction that many spiritual practices um, move in uh, to sort of escape d difficulties in the everything, right? All the things in life become difficult. And so there's one impulse of, of moving toward, you know, trying to get back to the nothingness. Whereas the other um, movement is that the nothingness represents infinite potential. Mm -hmm. Womb represents the infinite potential, potential. Mm -hmm. and the potential to create everything. And so that when we're in everything, even if it's difficult or painful, we can celebrate that it came from the womb, that infinite potential, and we can evoke the power of that nothingness to create new things, to create a new way, um, new possibilities, to give mm -hmm. us new opportunities and new possibilities in the everything 
trusting that we will one day return to nothingness, but we're here to experience everything that e emerges from from that nothingness for a time. Mm -hmm. And then we return to nothingness when our time is over. And so I'm curious um, <clears throat> to hear your reflections on that, and especially around this process of writing a book, because that's not nothing. Writing a book is a lot of things. <laughs> and, but coming, but uh, working with this creative process and creating, birthing something into the world out of that nothingness place is a unique process and i'm curious to hear about your creative process in that mm -hmm. in that way yeah which is really important um like one of my um, major revelations in the book is by how to become creative or how to set intentions from the weird from the nothingness which at the same time is all potential is about uh, centering ourselves in this weird the weird is also this in between between the in and the out breath, for example that's where the spirit lives that's where the whole potential lives and I like to do it through chanting I learned from a shaman thunder wizard and I write about in the book as well how to chant who Hul, for example, is a combination of three runes, Hagalash, uh, Urush, and Lagush. And all three runes, you can also imagine them when you chant it. It's like the Hagalash is like the uh, snowflakes, which come from above. And then um, it's like the Lagush, which is the water in the flow and then it melts the snowflake and then it goes gets to the root of the soil which is Urush, it stands for the roots and if you chant it it's also Hul is this like in German language it's like Höhle yeah it's also the cave and it's actually the original sound like our ancestors were chanting in caves they're like recordings where you can hear them chanting this like Ool. and it's also very similar to Om. Those are like the original sounds which connect us to this dark matter. Like it's the dark matter. It's also nothingness, but it's the same time contains all potential. Like most money nowadays in astrophysics goes into researching the dark matter, which is dark, but it doesn't mean it's nothing. It has got like such high energy. It's incredible. And our whole universe is 99% out of this dark matter, which I call the weird. So knowing how to send ourselves in this dark matter is paramount. And for me, it has been very, a big revelation to the chanting, either who Oh, weird and weird is also if you chant it repeatedly for like 10, 15 minutes, you, you really center yourself in this in-between place. Mm -hmm. And then you can set an intention like uh, for me, like what do I want to write about or what is present to me right now? And that's how it's, nourishes my creative process like for example the embroidery i always start by centering myself in the space which i call weird and so when you were writing your book i'd love to hear practically how that translates would you start each day with a chanting session or would you start each writing session with a chanting session um or and then would sometimes you just get an inspiration to write without needing to start with a chanting session or how how would that work well for me it has become like a ritual to always chant like for example now i've got also my candle on and then i will sit down and then for 10 15 minutes i would always like just sit down and chant and concentrate on this in between space or like this process of like going down, like the snowflake melting to the roots and then goes up. 
So it's it's a form of meditation. Yeah. And what for me was very important as well is like to have this dress where one of the symbols actually stands for the muse. So I actually putting on the dress and inviting my muse, <laughs> the muse goddess. So it's also part of my ritual. So this dress, yeah. now you've shared about it on previous interviews. You've actually embroidered all the symbols on this dress. And this is a big part, this sacred embroidery, um, spiritual embroidery. It's a big part of what you write about in the book. Can you, can you share a little bit more about how that embroidery particularly is one of the central creative processes in the weirding way? Yeah, that was my pers personal story of connecting to my own, what I perceive like destiny thread where I came home to myself um, is by, by, like, by learning how to embroider, first of all, this Slavic towel rushnik it's a very traditional form of embroidery which slavic women teach to the like youngsters and there is also very important to 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 meditate first to 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 be in a good state like connected with your soul before you take up the the needle and what makes this art particularly very sacred is that you have to know about the meanings of the symbols and and in all shamanic or ancestral cultures the ancient wisdom is that we are all interconnected with everything everything has got a soul it's called also animism so if you're consciously knowing what symbol you're embroidering and you're very in a very meditative state then each practice becomes a meditation it's very sacred and that's how you can lead your own destiny threads and manifest things which you know what the symbols are about in your in your life in the here now so for me that was like a, a big initiation into conscious living mm. and so you embroidered this muse goddess on your destiny towel. And uh, I know that you've, you embroidered many more symbols and you mentioned animism, which um, brought up for me uh, an important part of animism that I've been connecting with more and more, which is connecting with all of the creatures of the world as inten in intelligent relatives and, and yeah. valuable allies. And I know that if you stood up, we'd see your raven on your dress because I Yay! think before, can you show us the raven? The raven, yes, here in the middle. Uh -huh. And so I'm curious if you actually connect with, with ravens that are living in your neighborhood at all. Do you, do you, I, but I think you live in a, in a city, right? So you might not have ravens living nearby. Do you, but have we you? have got lots of ravens, right? Even though I live in the city but it's on the outskirts of the city and there's a cherry tree a massive cherry tree just in front of the house and there are lots of ravens so i hear them all the time uh -huh. also my ancestors it's my power animal power birth so you, say they're, you say they're also your ancestors what is what does that mean to you do you feel your ancestors are embodied in the ravens i feel like that yes since we are speaking about animism, for uh -huh. me, when I connected with my ancestors, they came to me in the form of the raven. Uh -huh. And also as this main goddess energy, of which I've embroidered on my dress, these are the seven symbols I've been given by a, a Russian woman who are doing soul horoscope readings based on 27 goddess energies from the Russian Slavic culture, mm -hmm. which are called Pereginis. So in this reading, I was given those seven symbols and one of mm -hmm. them, or my main one is the raven. And for me, I'm connecting with the raven now, like on a daily basis. 
is the wise one and the wise one stands also with the, for the wisdom of the ancestors mm -hmm. and also in the Norse mythology the god Odin has got two ravens mm -hmm. yeah and so and when you when you hear them outside in the cherry tree for you do you feel like they're talking to you or that they have a message for you sometimes or maybe when you walk by what are some of the messages they bring to you when you hear when you actually hear the ravens talking to you well for me it is like obvious very like like i would talk to someone directly like i talk to you it's like i the more I become present, oh, here they are, like I, I, I'm walking, uh, passing by, and then I ask them, oh, hello, my dear ancestors, what do you want to tell me today? And in this moment, I get always a message. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, it's the full moon, like today, it's, they're really, really present. I will do a, a meditation, like on every full moon, and then I'm always inviting the, the, the raven and then I ask them what is my next step in life how is my family in Kazakhstan and then I get an answer you know it's interesting because this morning I I'm sure many listeners are um having similar feelings as this and that I'm concerned for my loved ones, for our health at this time. And um, <clears throat> I was praying to Mother Earth about that. And I heard the ravens start, there was a raven outside just calling and calling and calling all morning long from early in the morning until I got up and, and started moving around. The raven was calling to me and I listened and the message that I got was that the ravens have this um, bigger viewpoint that the ravens can be up in the sky keeping an eye on the whole community and then and can see um, energies and, and realms that we can't necessarily see and the ravens have, have a very a sharpness about the energy of the raven that can discern truth from lies mm -hmm. and and so these are some of the messages as i was meditating and listening to the raven call <laughs> this morning in my in my morning reflections and my prayers that the raven was was really um uh offering herself as a as a powerful ally in these times of mm -hmm. uncertainty of being able to see clearly and discern truth from lies and keep an eye on the whole community and also uh she was asking for i've been giving the ravens offerings like i have a little plate out in the garden and i cut up apples or um other other tasty treats for them and they come mm. and, and take them and and give thanks like i remember one day i was out in the garden with one of my garden apprentices and we were right there um, maybe a few feet away from the plate of apples well first of all the plate was empty and when we went out and started working in the garden the ravens were calling at us insistently like where's our apple <laughs> <laughs> And so I said, okay, okay. And I went in and I made the apples and I put them there. And then we resumed working in the garden. And then suddenly I hear the raven again and I look up and it's in a tree right there with an apple in its mouth, waving the apple. <laughs> so we hadn't seen or felt it swoop down and grab an apple. And it's up there going, ha, 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 I'm too sneaky. I got the apple and you didn't even see me, you know? And we yeah. were- three feet away from the plate and the ravens are big birds right so yeah we they're have, massive yep. we might have heard something or felt the wind of its wings but it was so sneaky it just yeah silently invisibly got itself an apple <laughs> and so i'm curious if you make offerings to the ravens or how how else do you um, nurture that relationship by giving mm -hmm. uh from your part to the ravens 
But if I feel like it, then I, I always give them offerings. So or uh, when I do a ritual like today, the full moon with my ancestors, I always give uh, offerings as well. Give some sweets, some milk, some um, water and some alcohol. <laughs> some reason my ancestors like uh, to have some alcohol as well. Yeah. Uh, and similarly, if I'm in the nature, then I, if I feel the impulse, I always give some offerings uh, as well. And raven are, are just part of nature. If I'm outside, then and if I feel like it, then I always give something back as well. Mm-hmm. What are some but examples? I can communicate with them because they're the messengers. Yeah. You can really ask them questions. They're the messengers between other worlds and, and, and the physical world. And they're very clear in the, in the messages which they give. It's kind of their job to be the these messengers, and they have yes. such a they have such a compelling voice. Like when I when I recently, I've always been aware of the ravens, but recently have um, taken a deeper dive into animism and awareness that of these qualities that you're talking about. And now, whenever I hear a raven in the background, it's a stop what you're doing and look around and see where the raven is and listen to the message that the raven is giving you, which is different than before because it would just be a a nature sound, a background nature sound before. Whereas now I'm really hearing the call, the wake up call in the raven's (laughs) voice and and the importance of listening to whatever message is being offered at that time and your your sharing is certainly strengthening that for me yeah yeah so um i'm curious too about any um times during this because i'm in the process of writing the biomystical womb book as well and i'm curious about your rhythms of keeping the flow of your book writing and publishing process going. I know that, um, you know, there's other parts of the book writing process besides the creative writing, the flow of writing that um, even the flow of writing creatively can sometimes run into barriers and things that, that stop the flow. But then for me too, like the editing process and the p- process of finding a publisher, submitting it to a bu- publisher or the process of getting it formatted for self-publishing and all of these things that are less creatively inspiring perhaps. Um, and I'm curious which of these tools or maybe there's other tools or other practices that have helped you to successfully navigate and move through places that you might have gotten stalled out or blocked or slowed down in some way. Well, for me, it was really like a birthing process and to go with the natural cycles. I mean, my whole book is based on the chapters of the natural cycle of grounding where we have planted the seeds, which we all carry like a unique imprint in a soul seed and then setting down roots, then leaving the soil, leaving the comfort soil and then overcoming adversities in form like of healing our traumas, looking at our limiting beliefs, some conscious uh, programming before we can really bloom and fulfill our potential and live it out to the fullest. A natural cycle. And for me, it was the most valuable experience in this birthing process of the book that it was very similar, this process, and that I had to consciously live into this which cycle i'm currently in and personally because i'm in areas having had personal last saturday i i want something some things very quickly straight away like i want them to start go ahead and do them so for me it was a very like very valuable experience to feel into it like no which cycle is my book currently in yeah, and sometimes just building roots, like after I, I, I've written the draft very quickly, it was just weaving through me. But then like, okay, now it's there, the draft, now build roots that it's nourishing, yeah, that it's really come to fruition. And that took a long time for me. 
it took about six, seven months to just rest in, the, in this process of like the soil and just building roots. And what, yeah. was, what, what, what did you mean by building roots? So you had the draft of the book and then you mm -hmm. needed to do this building roots process. What did that look like? Just gestating with it, just sitting with it, or were there other were there other things that you were engaged in that were building the roots for the book? I was always engaged in in talking with people who have been already a step ahead, who have done it before. Like um, we already talked about as well, like uh, because I wrote um, I've written it by hand. I had to learn how to get it transcribed, how did other people do it in the writing process. So learning the tricks of the trade mm -hmm. that get me one step further. Mm -hmm. And that took a long, long period. Mm -hmm. And wow. it was like a gestation period, like where right. <laughs> it was not really visible, but I had to gain this knowledge about how to transcribe, which software to use to transcribe uh, and things like that. And that took a long time. So you had written the book out by hand with a pen and paper. Yes. And, and then you used a software to transcribe. But what that sounds like to me is that you read it and, and then it typed itself out with a transcription software. Is that it? Or did you type it in? No, it was uh, it was both because um, I did get a transcription software, it's like Dragons International is called, but because there were like many words which were not recognizable out of Norse mythology, a lot of it, like over half of it, I actually had to type out then myself by hand before the next process of finding editors, people who are going to read through it. So those are all processes which feel like setting down roots so it can be even mm -hmm. worth it. Yeah. And so, very important. So you had other people help you with the editing. Did you hire yes. them? Did you pay them? Do they just get a copy of the book? How did you make those arrangements? I had three people uh, who would, did it out of interest for my book, like my dear Rune sister. I read her book, wrote, wrote a review. So I've asked her in return to do the same for me. And it's all built on co-creation, very important. I have, would have never been able to do it by myself. It was always a process, okay, here I'm at, this is my gifts I want to share. But to actually bringing it to the world, I always had help with somebody who's already done it or who is interested to help me to co-create with me. It's, it's always been a co-creation process. And that's something that we share in common so much. I love that. Yes. Uh, we've done a lot of co-creation projects with you. And I was surprised when we were talking about doing this interview and when you were announcing your book, um, because you talked about writing about the biomystical womb apprenticeship that you've been participating in for the last, well, since last October. Um, yes. and, um, and I'm curious now that you mentioned that, what about the program did you include in the book? Is it just one section or is it throughout the whole book that the different parts of the program have been interwoven into what you wrote? I'm really curious what you wrote about the program in your book. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that we mentioned co-creation, the sixth chapter, it's actually about co-creative weaving. Once we started overcame the cyclical processes and came to the point of really living our potential, which is like blooming, then the next step is like sharing our gifts with the world. It's a natural cyclical process, the same like with trees, then they throw their seeds and spread it, and the flowers do exactly the same. And it's the same for us humans. So when it comes to this sharing of the gifts, which I also call the weirding way, if we lead our destiny friends in the conscious way, I, that's where I speak about the apprenticeship and how inspirational it has been to me to, to learn the tools, yeah, how to, how to work to, uh, with whom healing practices, like for example, the, the chanting. We do a lot of chanting in your course, in the apprenticeship. 
that that has been yeah so revolutionary to me mm -hmm. um, yeah and also doing the whole dancing and the dragon dance because to me uh, a very important healing point is getting to the roots it's also where the dragon lies or where the snake lies coiled up before the chakras start moving mm -hmm. it's a beautiful metaphor to work with the dragon in Norse mythology is the dragon Nidhöger who sits at the roots just a second <laughs> okay yeah I share the über eine Schlange ich komme gleich zehn Minuten okay bis gleich <laughs> <laughs> The, the dragon always calls the young ones in too sometimes. Yes, you're absolutely right because he loves snakes mm -hmm. and he heard me speaking about it. That's why he just knocked. He loves uh, the snakes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So you were saying the name of the Norse dragon who resides in the roots? Nidhöger. Yes. Nidhöger. And so a lot of things which have, we have not dealt with is like this iceberg when over 90 percent lie in the subconscious it, it's at the root of things which we don't if we don't integrate them then it's like this Nidhöger who is actually eating the roots of the world tree Yggdrasil so it's very important to get to the root and to integrate things which are in the subconscious and otherwise yeah eat our roots so and the weirding way, like we started the conversation, it's getting to the root of things of our existence and to really look what needs to be still healed or what is not whole yet. And well, right. And so it seems like the dragon eating the roots has a number of purposes. So that eating of the roots is, is like us digesting and integrating right the the roots of of existence and the real meaning of existence but also so that could be a real creative nourishing thing that the dragon is doing for us but it could also be a destructive thing if it's eating away at the roots that we need to have structural integrity as well um so there's a this double sided uh, aspect of this dragon eating the roots that's really fascinating i'd i'd be really curious uh, to to read some of the original mythology about that. I imagine you tell the story of that, of that a bit in your book too. Do you tell some of the original mythology stories throughout the book like that one? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. yes I do. do you and how important is also like with this with the chakra system uh, there is the snake it's also right. symbolized that the snakes in tantric tradition, for example, they're only in balance if we learn how to uh, to train the dragon or the, the snake, or, or which is like for the, our breath and for the opening of all chakras. And the snakes only meet for, and standing from the feminine, the masculine, if we learn how to deal with this uh, kundalini or the energy, which is the snake. Right. Right. And it's different cultures, it's different metaphors, different words, mm -hmm. which I feel it's the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in effect, in end effect, it's the same. Beautiful. Well, you know, I could talk with you all on and on all day because I love how this this interweaving of our of mythology and energy healing and our biology with the creative sourcing from the womb space and all of that. Um, but I'm sure listeners are very curious about how they might get a hold of a copy of your book. Um, wh what would be the best way to, to do that? Well, uh, it's available on Amazon. I can uh, send you the link. Okay, to, we'll to put that. Yeah. To where the people can get um, it's an ebook version and it's a paperback version okay uh, so it's the weirding way and the subtitle is tell us again the mysterious art of weaving your own destiny 
The Mysterious Art of Weaving Your Own Destiny. Wonderful. So look, look that up on Amazon and we'll put the link in the show notes. And as usual, uh, listeners can also find out more about the Womb Centered Healing Temple by going to wombcenteredhealing.com. Thank you again, Erica, for coming and telling us about your wonderful new book. And um, that's all for now. Until next time. Thank you, Seyma. Thank you, everyone who was listening. In Russian, Blagadaru, with Blagadaru. many blessings. Blessings. Blagadaru. Okay. Mm.